want to talk about real estate generally, um, sort of release our thoughts about what's happening in the business and trends. Um, and I'm talking here domestically in the U.S. Uh, and then I'm happy to have any questions about anything you'd like to talk about other than the Phillies, which I have no idea where, where that's going. But, uh, anyhow, so Liberty Property Trust. Um, I'm going to repeat a couple facts and I'll just try to adjust them. So we are a real estate investment trust. Um, and uh, many of you may know what that is and those who don't. So those were established in 1960. Uh, they are a vehicle um, established by the federal government. I always sort of characterize it sort of simplistically. So the theory was, how, do, how does John Q. Public own a piece of a mall or a, a piece of the Comcast Center or anything like that? Well, you can't, right? Real estate has generally been done, I guess you're in the business, right, a little bit. So partnerships, you know, so a few people get together, they put capital in, they borrow money. So there was no way for John Q. Public to do it. So the thought was, we'll create this vehicle, and the way the vehicle will work is it'll be a public company. It will have shares, so people can buy shares. That's how they'll own a piece of assets. Well, if you're in the real estate business, you're going, why would I not do partnerships that have tax advantage? Why would I want to go be a public company and pay corporate taxes? So the trade-off was, we'll let you not pay corporate taxes, REITs. So we don't pay federal tax. We don't pay state tax, business taxes pay property tax and all that. Uh, but for that, you need to take your, effectively take your net operating income and distribute it as dividends. Um, and so REITs are dividend stocks. Um, and I'll talk about REITs a little bit more at the end when I talk about what's happening with real estate. Um, but they have exploded uh, over the last 20, 30 years uh, as a vehicle by which real estate is owned and developed and operated in the United States. And the US REIT model has now been replicated in 30 countries around the world. Um, so there are now REITs. You can buy Japanese REITs, and you can buy Australian REITs, and you can buy European REITs. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, but that's, and I'm happy to answer questions about that. But let me talk about Liberty. So we're, we're a REIT. REITs generally are in particular product types. So we are in office buildings and warehouses. Um, and we do own a fair amount of it. Uh, we're actually, uh, it's 105 million square feet, but that's okay, who's counting? And, uh, uh, and then it's actually six million square feet under development right now. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. We are in 24 US markets. So we run from Southern California, Phoenix, uh, Minneapolis, Chicago, Dallas, and Houston. We're in uh, South Florida, Tampa, Orlando, the Carolina, Atlanta, uh, uh, Greenville, uh, Charlotte, Raleigh, uh, Greensboro, Richmond, Virginia Beach, uh, Washington, Jersey, here, Lehigh Valley, um, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Columbus, if that's 24 or 32, if not, I can get to that. Um, and then we're also in the UK. We have a modest presence in the United Kingdom, um, uh, which is a little different uh, and, is, and is not, it's owned by the REIT, but it's not covered by US REIT law, so we actually do pay tax in the UK. Uh, Okay, that's, that's where we're at. Um, out of that 106 million square feet, 18 million square feet is office buildings, and 88 million square feet is warehouses. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a minute. And we basically do everything that you do in real estate if you're a landlord. So we uh, ha uh, lease, uh, we own these assets. We lease them. Uh, we did 25 million square feet of leasing last year and about 800 plus transactions. We operate them, so we have Liberty property management teams that operate this real estate in the various markets. Obviously, we use third party vendors for the services, you know, janitorial or landscaping or whatever, but a lot of people run these assets. If you, if you call up about a Liberty, if you're a Liberty tenant, you're going to get a Liberty person at the other end of the line. Um, we also um, buy and sell real estate. Um, we've been very active in that, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then we build buildings. Uh, we're, we've historically been developers from our from our beginning. Uh, currently, we have 29 buildings under construction, uh, representing over six million square feet, and representing a total value of 1.4 billion dollars. Biggest development pipeline we've ever had in our history. There happened to be this very big building that was mentioned earlier. So, uh, this Comcast building, which I'll talk also about in a minute, um, is 921 million by itself. But even if you take that out, it's still, the pipeline's still about 500 million, which is a pretty large number for us. Uh, history. Thinking about our history, so how did we get here? So we were founded in 1972 uh, by Bill Reps. Um, and those of you who are like me and have either gray hair or less of it might remember Bill. Um, 
and Bill was a Baltimorean uh, uh, and uh, came here uh, to this region. That's a, it's a great real estate story, it's a great business story. So Bill, uh, you might have heard of the Rouse Company. There was a guy, Jim Rouse. Jim Rouse uh, is, I mean, famous in the history of real estate in America. So Jim Rouse is the person that developed the Cherry Hill Mall and sort of started malls in America, created the Rouse Company. He did Columbia, Maryland, literally bought thousands of acres and created a town. He did Fango Hall, um, the rest of that restoration, the first festival market in America in Boston. That was Bill's uncle. Bill's dad was the chief operating officer. So I always think, you know, visualize Bill's dad's <coughs> dinners. You know, he learned the business probably by osmosis, right, uh, with a family like that. But they had an interesting rule, at least this is the story, um, so sort of a anti-nepotism. So when Bill got out of the uh, University of Virginia, they said, oh yeah, you want to be in the business? Go, fine, go, go figure out how to be in the business. We're not hiring you, right? Now, I think he had a better Rolodex uh, than Rolodex's work, you know, went ahead at the time. So Bill worked a little bit in Texas, a little bit in California. They ran into a guy in California. He said, well, you seem like an interesting young man, um, and I'll give you $10,000 work for six months to go to southern New Jersey. I own 600 acres there that I've never even seen. I bought as part of some other transaction. Go figure out what we should do with it. Bill came, looked, and said, I think you should build some warehouses on it. Well, go figure out how to build out warehouses. And it was the old traditional real estate model, right? So you'd go to the bank and try to get a construction loan, and you'd hope the loan was 101% of the cost, and maybe get a developer <coughs> fee, and then you'd build the building and try to get a lease and be able to put a mortgage on it. I mean, that was real estate, right? That's how we started. Um, because Bill started that project, and he was just you know, employed there. And then uh, one day the guy says, uh, okay, this is great. You built up this portfolio. We're selling it. <laughs> Bill called his dad and said, the guy's selling it. He said, well, now you've learned the golden rule. If you want to be in charge, you better own it yourself. So Bill took his 2% interest, which was $80,000, started this company with three other guys. That's how we got started. So we started out in the development business. We started out with warehouses in Jersey. Bill quickly went out and bought real estate out on Route 202. So Great Valley Corporate Center, which is where we're headquartered, uh, which at the time was a two-lane road, again, for those of us who've been around long enough to remember this, um, and basically created the 202 corridor. Bill's the guy who came to Philadelphia and said, why are all your buildings shorter than City Hall? And so Liberty Place was developed by this company. That we were, by the time our predecessors were Rouse and Associates at the time, that's what we traded as. And then we went public in 1994. Um, and by the way, within the first year, Bill was sending people to Jacksonville and people that, so we were, we've been a multi-market, multi-product company since our, since our origins. 1994, we went to public. Um, by the way, tons of REITs went public that period of time. It has to deal with technicalities, not worth boring you with. To change the law made it more attractive to be a REIT. And so often people say that's the beginning of the modern REIT era, 1994. Um, so we've been around a while. Our IPO was about 700 million, so we've done, I guess, okay. Um, since we're building a building that's worth more than the entire company was uh, when we started, and we're worth, as uh, I said, about 8.7 8 billion. So that's a little bit about sort of, sort of who we are and what we do. In this region, most of you think of us with the Comcast Center, obviously, uh, originally. We built that, uh, we developed it, and uh, remained the managing partner, had a 20% interest, and we're the managing partner and developer of the new Comcast Innovation and Technology Center. We're, we're also the folks doing the Navy Yard project um, and have built out that product uh, down there uh, uh, also. So that's a little bit of just kind of the flavor of Liberty uh, and who we are and, and what we've been doing uh, over time. It gives you, I think just give you some sense of that. Um, in terms of how we operate financially, um, which is a little different than that historic model, so the way Liberty operates is um, we have an $800 million line. So we do not do construction loans. We just build the building and pay for the construction off the line. Uh, we have a balance sheet that's 60-40 equity in debt. And all our debt, almost all of our debt, is unsecured corporate notes. So we borrow money like GE or IBM. We don't mortgage our properties. We don't have mortgages on the assets. We do have some mortgages because we bought them with mortgages and things like that. We have some joint ventures that have mortgages, but why don't we mortgage? <clears throat> a couple reasons, and one is as, uh, as current as yesterday. So uh, we've been building a lot of buildings. Uh, we paid off one of our uh, pieces of unsecured corporate debt at the beginning of March, so we, our line was up to 470 million. Last Thursday, we decided 
it looks like the market's pretty good. Uh, let's go borrow some money. Um, we got the teams organized. They started at nine o'clock yesterday. By two o'clock yesterday afternoon, we borrowed four hundred million dollars. <laughs> you can't do that the old way, right? You know, go get a mortgage, yep. and you know, title reports and environmental reports, and you know, sixty, ninety days to close with a with a bank, right? Um, so we find it massively efficient, right? Oh, by the way, three seven five. So it's three three point seven five interest only ten year paper. That's tough to beat, right? That's part of the reason we went. We started, when we went out yesterday morning, we thought we'd do 300, and the CFO came in and said, look, you want to do four, we can do four, there's enough in there, so we spent the four. And we're pretty convinced rates are going up soon. Um, the other reason it's, it's effective is it works with our business model. So you're in um, Houston, and you're one of our customers, and your business is doing well, and you're growing out of space. And you say, hey guys, um, I'm in 50,000 square feet of one of your, your warehouses and I need, I need to go to 75. And, but this building's full. So almost all of Liberty's assets are owned in parks. We like to own multiple buildings in a single location for a host of reasons. Um, and we'll say, well, you know, that's not a problem because we'll just put you in the building across the street, which has 75, and we'll just rip up the lease here. And I'll just go over there. And that ability to handle our customers and move them around, and we're done. We don't have to go to some lender and say, we just took some of your collateral and moved it across the street, right? We don't have to do that. It is massively effective uh, in the field, right? So it works, just, it works, the balance sheet is actually driven by the business model coming out versus the balance sheet driving the business model coming in. Sort of get, get, get where I'm going with that. So, um, so that's who we are and kind of what we're about. Um, let me talk a little bit more then about what we think is going on in real estate in the United States right now. And this, some of this I'll come back and talk about what we're doing in response to it. And I'm only going to talk about the two property types we own, uh, which are office buildings and warehouses. I'm not going to talk about, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything, but that's not the business we're in. We're in, we're in those two products. About seven years ago, uh, we went through a pretty exhaustive analysis, a strategy session. It took us over a year. We had outside consultants. And we said, look, we're a REIT. We're going to stay a REIT. We build these kind of and own these kinds of buildings. But what should we look like 10 years from now? Where's the world going as best you can try to figure it out? And how should we position ourselves? And we came up with a variety of conclusions um, and had acted on those conclusions in the interim. Um, we got a little bit waylaid with that great recession, uh, which was everybody you know, being in survival mode. So we took, took about three years out of our strategy execution. But the conclusions we reached were as follows. Number one, uh, looking at office space, we got very nervous about office space long term. How much of it should we own? Where should we own it? And what type should it be? And the reasons we got nervous Number one is a reason that we all know so well, which is technology. So what technology is doing is it's, it's lowering the number of square feet per employee you need to put somebody in an office building. You don't need filing cabinets. You don't need bookshelves. You're a law firm. You remember the old law library? You don't need that, right? You're going to go on the... Um, used to be there were data rooms. I'm, I'm old enough to remember a data room with a raised floor, big main frames. Then we went to servers, racks. Then we went to virtualization. We could put multiple applications on servers. Now we can do the cloud. You don't need a data room at all. So, so that technology drive is meaning single employees, you don't need as much space. Add to that the way people are being configured in space. So the old model, you know, I think the law firm is prototypical here, right? Partner gets the big office, you know, associate gets small office, assistants are, you know, in, in, in inside the space, right? They don't have to get a window view, right? Your secretary's never got a window view. Conference rooms are when people came in, they're very elaborate. Open floor, went to cubicles. Now we go to open floor. And when you do all of that, again, you need less square feet per employee. Here is a dramatic example in this town. You only have to go a couple blocks from here, 17th and Vine, and you can go to where GlaxoSmithKline had their operation 
Philadelphia. They occupied the entire one Franklin building, roughly over 600,000 square feet, and they occupied the entire building we had built across next to it, that we built the bridge across. Um, yeah, that was another couple hundred thousand square feet. They were 800,000 square feet paying rent. They were using about 400,000 square feet. So they'd already shrunk in terms of the number of people. We built them a brand new building at the Navy Yard. Spectacular project. <coughs> it's a double platinum, by the way. So it's both the building's platinum and the interiors are platinum. This is a, from a environment. It's 205,000 square feet, and it houses the exact same number of people that were in the 400,000 square feet. Great for us, 15 year deal, right? At higher rents than they were paying. By the way, higher rents than they would have paid anywhere in town. They were willing to pay it to go into a brand new building. There are no file cabinets. There are no phones. There are no hardware phones. Everybody works off their um, laptop, Bluetooth, right? There are no assigned seats. You're assigned an area, your finance, you go to that section, your legal, you go to that section. There are no cubicles, it's all tables. There are no offices, absolutely no offices. There are tables. Many of the tables elevate. You can stand and work if you want, right? Everybody gets a kind of a locker where you can store things, but you don't own a space. End of the day, there's no paper out. You want to file something, you have to make a phone call to somebody to justify why you need a file. Why isn't it digitalized? You know, why, why are we physically holding this document? Dramatic. Dramatic. They spent over a year putting every employee in space that looked like that that we mocked up for them in, in, on one of the floors where they were to get people oriented. Because literally they were afraid people would show up in this newspaper and not even know where to go. <laughs> they were afraid people wouldn't like it. If they do a posting today, every employee that works for Glass in the United States wants to look in that building. Emails down by 30%. Because everybody can see everybody. You just walk around and talk to everybody. <coughs> you don't have to do it, right? Um, and by the way, if you went in the space, you wouldn't think you were crowded. Big food area, fitness area, um, rooftop green, uh, outside, Wi Fi everywhere. So, by the way, you can work anywhere, right? You're always connected. Now, that's extreme, but that's one of the things that worry us. That it would start looking like that. Okay. Um, you also have firms that have thought about, wait a minute, I'm renting space for you to be there, but you're rarely here. I've heard some folks here are you know, accountants and insurance people and whatever, right? You're out with customers a lot. So firms are looking at hoteling. Um, in other words, and by the way, every uh, big four firm here in town, when they renewed their lease, shrunk. They sat there and said, why am I paying for everybody to have a space? You'll come. You're going to be in here today, John. You can go to over. You know, there's your place, right? It's assigned to you because they know, on average, X number of people are on the road, not in the office. So, tell them another concept. Another concept is work from home. We had about four FedEx call centers in our portfolio. FedEx figured out, I don't need to pay you rent for a call center. I just give somebody access to that. They can do this at home. All four are gone as a physical reality. So if you call FedEx to find out where your package is, you might be talking to somebody in their kitchen, right? <laughs> so all of that made us scared about office space, right? Um, and, and, and how much of it we wanted and where we wanted it. So we went through an effort, we've been through an effort now to massively downsize our office portfolio. We have sold 15 million square feet of office space in the last uh, three or four years. We plan to sell another four or five million square feet of it this year. Uh, we have exited, we were in 16 office markets uh, as a subset of that 24. Uh, and we have exited now nine of them, and we'll probably exit two more. Uh, we don't want to be in what we call um, smaller, what we tend to call sort of thin and narrow. So these are small, you know, Milwaukee we got out of, Richmond we got out of, Greensboro, Jacksonville. Great towns, great towns to live in, whatever, but they don't have big office markets. If a single guy leaves the market with 200,000 square feet, it's going to take forever to fill it back up. Um, the other thing that's happening is that customers want the best space. Um, so there's this movement to go to A space. So the portfolio we own 
We have developed more lead buildings than any other firm in the country. So we've done 86 lead buildings to date. We also have 100 and we've done 130 Energy Star buildings, which is a technique by which you measure your, your energy with an EPA sponsor. So right now, 70% of our office buildings are either lead or Energy Star, because we think that's what customers want. Customers want a space, and one of the reasons they want a space are employees. So um, probably many of us have sons and daughters who are in this generation, the millennials, right? So they want to be in collaborative space. They want to live in town. They prefer not to commute. They prefer to be in an environmentally sensitive building. And there aren't enough of them for employers. So what we thought was going to start to happen, and we're seeing it, is employers are falling employees in terms of location, instead of employees falling employers. We all think back, IBM went to uh, uh, Westchester County and built a big campus. I can work for IBM. Well, I'll commute out to Westchester, right? Perfect example here is Vanguard. By the way, our biggest single customer. Uh, we're the only people they rent space from. So I love Vanguard. I think they do an awesome job. But they're out there, right? So they run shuttles uh, from the Paoli train station. They've got workers living in Maniac, workers living in town that go out. They, are, they, they seriously have to think about whether they want to come into town to access that labor pool. So suburban office space is challenged, B space is challenged, smaller markets are challenged. We've res hopefully responded accordingly, shrunk that footprint. We're not out of the business. Obviously, we're building at the Navy Yard, we're building Comcast. We have a terrific project in, uh, so we're in Phoenix. We're, we have a ter terrific project in Phoenix where we're building a brand new product. But we think the office business is going to be a business that requires more about development, new product, and that there will be functionally obsolete buildings that will struggle for reuse. Historically old office buildings, this town is a perfect example of this, terrific example of this. Um, so we've taken all of our 20s and 30s and 40s office buildings and we've converted them into apartments and hotels. Part of the reason is they lay out perfectly. They're double barrel core. They didn't. They needed natural light, right? So they were narrow foot plates. They were double barrel corridors, and they're easy to convert. A building like this is a rectangle or a square. It's a more modern building, but this building doesn't jump out at you and say, "I want to be an apartment building," or "I want to be a hotel." So the day these buildings don't function as office buildings or have a demand for them, I think they will struggle for reuse. That's what's happened with one Franklin. Back to class. That building has been empty since they left, and they're now trying to figure out whether it should be a hotel or apartment building. Like, what, what am I going to do with it? Right? We sold our building that we leased out to a school, not to an office unit. The other side of this was about industrial buildings, warehouses. And we've been in this business a long time, um, and we looked at where that's going and what should we do in response to that. And we reached an entirely different conclusion. And the conclusion we reached was that that's a business that's going to grow over time. So there's a simple reason, uh, uh, which is population growth. So we did an analysis, and for every person in every metro, you need about 50 to 60 square feet of warehouse space. Stunningly consistent. Just for all the stuff, right? Where are these paper plates coming from? Where's Coach to run those bottles when you go to your office? Where's the pa you know, paper pad coming from? When you go to CVS, where do they get their supplies? You know, just think about all the stuff that has to be somewhere every day have this region work. So as long as the population grows, it actually has a higher correlation than employment. Uh, there'll be a need for more warehouses. That was one. Secondly was a change in distribution patterns. So big companies are very smart about inventory. You all know the right? Inventory is a cost. So you'd love to decrease your inventory. Logistics and distribution is a cost. So you're trying to squeeze down your supply chain. So the way companies have looked at that is they go through very elaborate analysis about where to put buildings that store their stuff, and then how that stuff gets to their customer. So where's it coming from? Is it coming on a container from China? Is it docking in uh, LA, Long Beach? Is it going on a train to a warehouse in Chicago and then being distributed across the United States? Like what are all those patterns? And the answer is that all these companies, you know, whether it's 
Procter and Gamble or Walmart or you know, just name all anybody can think of a retailer, a consumer products firm, a food firm, go through thinking about this a lot. And what we saw was they often change their patterns. And when they change it, they need new product. And when they need new product, someone's got to build it for them, and that's a business way. So we wanted to be more in that business. We just completed last year the biggest warehouse we've ever built. 1.8 million square foot warehouse. That warehouse is bigger square footage wise than a Comcast measure. Think about that. It's a very big building. It's in Shippensburg. South of Harrisburg, if you don't know where Shippensburg is. Um, why? Why? Because they made a decision, they'd take various product lines and put them all in one place and have trucks bring multiple brands to various places they have to distribute. So whether it's the Walmart or you know, whether it's the CD, whoever needs Procter & Gamble products. Um, so that's happening all the time. We currently own 1,900 acres across the United States, uh, almost all industrial land, uh, in order to be able to be responsive to the needs for new warehouse distribution product from different customers. That's one. So it's population growth distribution pattern. The third reason we buy the industrial would get bigger is e-commerce, which has absolutely taken off. So, you know, we're all home at night, we're at the computer, you're a runner, you want some new sneakers, you want a new jersey, you want a new cap or whatever, you're gonna order your three things and push the button at 10 o'clock because you want it tomorrow morning, you want it from FedEx so I can run tomorrow night, right? That's what you want. In order for Amazon to satisfy that requirement, like what, what actually happens? What happens is that order goes to a warehouse, a, what they call fulfillment center. And if you looked at it real fast, you'd say it looks like every other warehouse I've ever seen. If you go off to Jersey Turnpike, right, you see all these new <coughs> warehouses, right? And they all look the same. And it's kind of true, but not exactly true. So in the old warehouse, the P&G warehouse we just finished, Right, which is which is uh, um, consumer product to store. It's racked. There's racking. There's big pallets. There's forklifts. There's tractor trailers on each side. This tractor trailer bringing product. This tractor trailer grabbing product, taking it to stores. It's an operation that's pretty predictable. So I'm going to do all the Jersey stores on Monday, and I'll do all the Delaware stores on Tuesday, and so it's a generally a two shift operation. Um, maybe even closed on weekends. You know, kind of predictable, right? E-commerce. You just put that order in. Somebody has to physically go get the sneakers and the hat and the, and the you know, your little outfit, put them in a box, put a label on it for UPS. So what that building looks like on the inside is it's mezzanine, same building, 30 foot clear. And instead of racks going up 30 feet, there's, there's, it's as if it's two floors. And there are um, racks where there's, and think about this. So just take the sneaker example. They have to have every size of every color you want. So whereas a CVS warehouse, we have one in Orlando, has 27,000 products in it. An Amazon warehouse might have 150,000 discrete items by size, color, whatever, in order to fulfill what you need. So somebody has to go grab those three things. Here's how Amazon works. The computer knows the weight of everything you just asked for. It knows the, it knows the box it'll fit in. It delivers the box to the, to the uh, conveyor. So the person who grabs the thing things down is the box that they're going to fit in. It is weighed as it goes out. And if the weight is wrong, they know they mispackaged it, the wrong products inside, and they bounce it out. The label's printed. The tape is automatically provided for the person to wrap it. <coughs> you know, I mean, it's the classic, you know, I don't want to spend more tape than we need. So it's a very, so to do that, that building runs 24-7. Because gosh knows when you make place your order and push the little shopping cart, right? So I need people there all the time. I need tractor trailers on one side and UPS or Amer uh, FedEx trucks on the other side. I need employees. I need lots of employees. Between Thanksgiving and the, and, the, and, the, and the end of the year, I need three times the employees I have at any other time of the year. So I need a big parking lot, and I need to be near those workers. And those workers tend to be, that's a kind of a part-time job, and what that job pays, you're going to drive them more than half an hour. 
He's not going to commute an hour for a part-time job at Amazon. So those buildings are creating a parallel system of distribution in America. So I've got the stores are distributed one way, and e-commerce is another way. For us at the moment, that's great because you know everybody needs. Well, you can ask the question later. What, what happens if all the stores go away and those first sets of warehouses become surplus? That's an interesting question. But for the next ten years, we think we're okay. Um, so we have dramatically changed the size of our industrial footprint. We bought a portfolio in the fall of 2003. It was 23 million square feet for 1.4 billion. Uh, that's what got us into Southern California, Dallas. We weren't there before. So part of the decision we made seven years ago was we were going to be a national industrial player. And here we are. So we were in uh, 24 industrial markets, eight of the top 10, 14 of the top 20. The markets we're in handles 67% of all the warehouse requirements in the United States. So we think we're in the right place. We can build off of that, double the size, triple the size of the warehouse, you know, the amount of warehouse space we have in the company. So it gives us great growth prospects. So that's what we see happening with those two product types over time. And I'll close with sort of what, what's happening kind of with the space generally, and then maybe open it up. So I mentioned REITs at the beginning. So when REITs in 1994, they changed the law to make it a little bit more attractive a vehicle. The entire market cap of all REITs uh, was about $9 billion uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. Today, there's 260 REITs on the New York Stock Exchange worth $880 billion. Take malls. This is the, kind of the very far. I might, might if you read, pay attention to sign ins up, trying to buy another, another REIT. So, number one and three got together to take out number two. It would be interesting. <laughs> Top five REITs in the mall space own 90% uh, of all Class A malls in America. They've basically all been consolidated. In our space, like warehouses, all the industrial REITs, there's uh, eight of us, we only own 4% of the product. So what I think you're going to see is the REITs will continue to own more of it, right? Like we have access to capital, we have scale, uh, et cetera. So what's happened in real estate, and again, go back 30 years ago, it was an industry that was a little bit of a black box, like what, what actually happens? How do, people, how do people make deals? What do partnerships look like? So market information was hard to get. Who knew what real rents were, et cetera. So that same technology that's affecting office use is affecting the transparency of this business. So today, there's a company called CoStar, and you can find out all kinds of information about you know, what got leased and what it got leased for and what's available and how much. You have 240 REITs every quarter getting you public information about what we rented space for, how much it cost, you know, what we bought it for, what's it costing us to build, build, and that's a lot of information, right? There's a company called uh, Real Estate Analytics. will tell you about every sale that happened in the U.S. Uh, real time in commercial real estate. So commercial real estate has become a much more acceptable asset class to invest in. You know, you're not as nervous as you used to be. So pension funds, endowments, Wealthy individuals um, are all putting money in. So there is a flow of capital to own real estate in an institutional sense that didn't exist 30 years ago. In Japan, um, it's a big thing. So if you're an individual, uh, individuals invest in funds that buy U.S. REIT stocks because we produce this dividend that's much higher than any other investment vehicle they can find. Uh, at the moment. So there's been inflows of Japanese retail money into the space. All of that is driving the pricing of real estate, which is it's pretty expensive. So you're hearing incredible numbers. You probably just heard uh, there was a Chinese insurance firm buying the Waldorf Astoria at over a thousand bucks a square foot. And those are pretty impressive numbers. You want to buy a warehouse in uh, Southern California? Fully leased, good 10 Amazon 10 year credit. Uh, Folks know what a cap rate is. Cap rate is income it's in the numerator, purchase price in the denominator. Low cap rate, very high price. Uh, that'll go for uh, a four, cap, four, four and a half cap. It's like my bar. These are the highest prices paid for this kind of real estate in, in anybody's kind of memory, right? And then part of it is it's, it's solid, you know, solid asset. I own it, it's cash, it feels good. Um, but part of it is that the asset class has matured and is viewed as an absolutely safe bet, right? Some of this capital, by the way, is exiting places of instability. 
right? Rule of law matters. So um, if you're in property, right, I actually know that I can enforce my lease, I can enforce my ownership, et cetera. Um, so we just think it's a kind of a great time to be a REIT. Uh, it's a great time to be in this business. Uh, economy is pretty decent. Um, and so we're having, we're having some fun doing it. Maybe with that, I'll close. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah.